So if you've muted just if you've muted yourself, I'd like to welcome you to today's class with Rabbi Akiva, live from Israel. Great, thanks, Alan. So uh, good morning to you all. Uh, friends, we, we, ended, we ended last week uh, on, on a very important note. Uh, and and however, it, 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 boil, it boils down to this. It boils down to this. There's, there's a certain contradiction that we have to cl uh, clarify in, in, in our minds, uh, in our minds and in our souls. And the and 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 this, I think, boils down to the, to to an ultimate uh, contradiction, and not a contradiction, an ultimate paradox, an ultimate paradox. And that is if we are enjoined. By, by everything Jewish, <laughs> by Jewish philosophy, by Jewish mysticism, by Jewish theology. If we are, uh, by Jewish mysticism, to conceive of divinity as ineffable, as infinite, as a God that, that cannot and never will take on, uh, cannot be embodied by anything. That, that really, you know, it, it, that, that is what Judaism boils down to, uh, what monotheism boils down to. And please, please uh, exercise a little self-transcendence that, that the, 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 the God of Israel and the God of the Torah, as represented in the Torah, is, is this ineffable, infinite, ein sof, keter-like, force, energy, that memale kol almin v'sovev kol almin, that surrounds all of existence and fills all existence. And uh, on one level, And then on another level, Judaism's insistence that this transcendent being that is so cos cosmically uh, all-pervading and yet impossible to describe, yet Judaism maintains an insistence that this Keter God is also the God of Pathos, a God, a divinity, a, an energy that feels with us. The, 
that loves us and expects love back, that this ineffable, infinite being also is a covenantal God, which means a God of relationship, a God of pathos, a God of feeling. a God who cares, a God who suffers together with our suffering. And one can say a, a, a God who exercises emotion. Now, these two ideas, the God of Keter and the God of Pathos, seem, seem to be paradoxical. They see, it seems to be paradoxical. So we concluded last week that it turns out that there is a very fine balance, Hevra. And, and, and th this is our, uh, uh, like, like, can be summarized as our, 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 our total approach to Torah. It turns out that there is a very fine balance, a, if, if you like, a tiferet balance. Uh, in, the, in the Sphira chart, tiferet is right at the center. Tiferet, in mystical terms, is called the bolt because it is the bolt that, that uh, connects the higher spheres to the lower spheres. It is that bolt of, of harmonious balance. It turns out that there is this harmonious, a very fine harmonious balance has to be maintained between the absolutely necessary employment of, of human pathos language and the vigilant awareness of language's inadequacy. And no one said that was going to be easy. And one of Maimonides' great uh, ideologies that comes from the Guide for the Perplexed is to indicate to us how inadequate how inadequate the, the Torah's language is to describe divinity, to describe Adonai Echad. And Maimonides concludes that The Torah did her best, and the Torah is the consummate fine balance in maintaining the transcendence of God, of divinity, 
while paradoxically hinting at the pathos of that divinity without leaving out this divinity that is like way above and has nothing to do with us. So the Torah, Maimonides says, is the best description of a divinity that remains transcendent and, and in a way incomprehensible, but that God would do us no good. And the Torah is the, the revelation of the best way to describe in an infinite God, but with character, with personality, and with caring. And that is the sum total of the Torah. And Maimonides, is, Maimonides cautions us. And I, I think we have to learn this lesson uh, very deeply. Maimonides, is, Maimonides cautions us. Remember, remember years ago, decades ago, we can say decades because I've been with you for 23 years, that when we started our classes, I used to say over and over, please don't take me literally. Don't take me literally, what, what I'm about to say, don't take me literally. And I discovered that in, in while working on the Guide for the Perplexed for these uh, lectures, that in, in many different ways, Maimonides is asking us also to, when we, re, when we study and we learn and we, and we extract from the Torah, he cautions us in the Guide for the Perplexed, please do not take the Torah literally. <laughs> There's some things that we take literally. Mitzvot, we take literally. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt uh, 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 keep, keep the, the Sabbath holy. That mitzvot, we take literally because they are meant to be taken literally. But outside of that, Maimonides asks us, Please broaden your scope. Please broaden your horizons when, when studying anything else outside of specific mitzvot. To look at the Torah with enlightened eyes. With, with not with microscopic eyes, but with telescopic eyes. When we read about the narratives of Abraham's life and Isaac, and, and, the, and, and uh, I'll go a little bit into specifics, uh, in, into, into the, the story of, of of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Maimonides says, this is not a little story about our forefather and our 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 foremother and and uh, and and some some uh, some concubine called Hagar. Uh, it, it's not. It's do, do not view it that way. This story is of historic and cosmic. 
concern. Dig deep into it. When you read the story of the Akedah, it, it's, not, it's not about a little Isaac being sacrificed and instead of the sacrifice, it's, uh, they, they, took, they took a little sheep and sacrificed the sheep instead. Maimonides is asking us throughout the guide for the perplexed to put on different lens to put on different lenses and to take the literal narrative to its deepest deepest level its deepest universal level And to take descriptions about God, depictions of, uh, about divinity in the most non-literal sense possible. And Maimonides warns us that those who narrowly view the Torah and the narratives in, in the Torah and, and also in Nach, in, in the rest of the scriptures, who narrowly take it as a historical account only and do not see past that, are not only misunderstanding the Torah, but dis distorting the Torah and creating a certain type of idol worship out of the narratives of the Torah. He says, be very careful, be very careful of anthropomorphic language. And I really see, friends, in, 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 in my history with, with Jewish minds over, over my, my rabbinate, I, I, I hear this cautionary warning of Maimonides so clearly because of the Jews and, and non-Jews that I have met, but predominantly Jews that I have met that, that carry around with them such, such a, a confused perception of, of the Torah, they, they and 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 admittedly so. I I do not I do not blame the people. I do not judge the people. I I actually am perplexed and perturbed about some of the. anthropomorphic displays in the Torah that lead to such misconceptions. And I, I do believe that that is why uh, in, 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 in the last few decades, that in, in the last few decades, why Jews have very much uh, been 
enamored towards Eastern religions because some of the Eastern religions, some, some of them have, have unbelievable anthropomorphic uh, imagery, but some have separated the anthropomorphic imagery and concentrated uh, very much on on uh, on a transcendent kind of divinity that reflects Judaism's transcendent divinity, and I think that was that that was the attraction, and that's and that still is the attraction. In, in fact, there are there are many many a a uh, a, a Jew, Jewish Jewish uh, wisdom teachers today that are very much connecting some aspects of Eastern Eastern spirituality to to uh, Western classical. Uh, Judeo-Christian philosophy uh, and, and trying to, to uh, separate some of the, the, the anthropomorphic anthropomorphism uh, that, that uh, in, in Jewish uh, in Jewish theology that is absolutely misunderstood, and therefore has to be purified from, from, its, uh, fr from its drag, its drag on people. But Maimonides wants to say, that ultimately Hevra, when you, when you come down to it, I'd like, I'd, I'd like some of some comments from you after I finish this. Maimonides concludes we ultimately have to use anthropomorphic language in order to convey divinities non anthropomorphic transcendent being. There is no way out of it. Says Maimonides. And that's why the Torah utilizes anthropomorphic language. It's used only to develop an idea or to convey the idea about divinities, non-anthropomorphic uh, being. The only way to do it is through anthropomorphic metaphor. It's paradoxical. It's it it reminds me of that of that Eastern uh, koan that that Eastern paradox where where someone where someone it's I think it's a it's a good one when someone uh, is is meaning there are two people on the ground and someone is pointing to the moon and all the second person is really seeing is the other person's finger. <laughs> we have this unbelievable Yetzer Hara, this inclination that when we hear a myth, 
when we hear an anthropomorphic description or depiction, we confuse the moon and the finger. So friends, on one level, this is a very, Maimonides' uh, theory here is a very universal theory. I think, I think when, when he is saying, I mean, there are different, different qualifications to what I am going to say, but I, I do believe that, that it is true that when Maimonides and then further on with, uh, with mystic, Jewish mysticism, when Judaism announces, and I think this is an important point, and it leads to what, what is happening in Israel today uh, as we speak. When Judaism announces that And this was done in the medieval ages, in the times, in the times of Maimonides. When Judaism announces that all, however, listen to this, that all monotheistic religions and traditions are valid and acceptable that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in Maimonides' day and, and further in the philosophical age and in the mystical age that was to follow that Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are all monotheistic religions and are not, are not and should not be considered pagan religions. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? Of course, things from the 12th century changed till now with, 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 with significant variables, but it remains the same that Christianity and Islam and, and, uh, are monotheistic religions. That, friends, is telling me that if one religion or tradition uses different metaphors, If one religion or tradition uses different anthropomorphic depictions, if any one of these three religions use different language, and admittedly every language is inadequate, But if we use different language to depict the, 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 the divinity of Melochal Haaretz Kivodo, then we are of one mind. That is good. And that is 
that can serve as a unifying factor for the sovereignty of a divinity that bonds all peoples together, all nations together. And that's why Judaism insists in theory, on paper, that as, as long as you have not crossed over a line, a certain line, that, that is going to totally be a distortion of, of Hashem Echad, then you are included in the group of monotheistic religions and traditions. So in, on, on paper, it's good. In, in, in theory, it's good. This is the one binding idea that not only uh, it, it, it creates a depiction of divinity that all peoples can find in common, but, uh, but that leads to humanity, humanity becoming also echad. If we can feel a unity in, in, uh, in the monotheistic uh, epicenter of Islam and, and of, of Christianity, uh, I, I, certainly, I certainly would think that that would bring uh, uh, pe people of these religions and traditions together. And that would bring humanity together. So in theory, that is a wonderful idea. What, I, what I'm seeing today, what we are seeing today, is there is no end to the announcements on Israeli TV and radio. And you have heard it yourself that because because of the convergence of Pesach and Ramadan and Easter, the convergence of, of those three major holidays occurring in, 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 within a few days of each other is causing an uproar in, in, in Jerusalem in, in East Jerusalem, like no other. Mamash, mamash the opposite. The three monotheistic religions that my, Maimonides said can bring together this unity of perception of divinity, uh, three monotheistic religions coming together. And the only difference between us is language is anthropomorphic language. Has that experiment worked out for us in 2022? Uh, I, I say not, for the most part, not. In some pockets, yes. In some pockets, yes. But there is a sense of disappointment when uh, from, from philosophical, theological truths to what, to what the, the masses are a bunch of asses, how, th how the masses uh, are able to take this beautiful, pure idea where the three monotheistic religions should be as one and, and find beautiful harmony and tiferet zones for ourselves in this and beautiful dialogue. And we have allowed anthropomorphic 
and meta metaphoric theology to dominate and create distortion and misunderstanding of the purpose. Oh, be, only because we are looking at the shallow level. Only because we look at, 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 our, at our Torah and, and the Christian Bible and the Quran, because all of us are looking at it only on the surface. And we are allowing metaphor and inadequate, admittedly inadequate biblical language to distort the, the truth behind all three religions, all three of them. If we only understood Maimonides' caution that language is inadequate, any, any and every religious language is inadequate. And each and every tra religious tradition, uh, if, if they ju just would be listening to Maimonides' wisdom on this, then we would go beneath the surface and find, we would find divine truth, we would find humanity within our, our religious traditions, and we uh, would ultimately find the, the, uh, the divine purpose. We have allowed language. To dominate our thinking. Don't take me literally, says the Torah. Don't take me literally. Every metaphor, every anthropomorphism, dig deeper. Don't get caught up in religious trappings, says the Torah. Okay, Chavre, a few comments, a few, a few angry outbursts. <laughs> Now, I think you just created a world peace. I'm sorry, is this what? I think you just created world peace. <laughs> <laughs> but I also remember that you used to start every single class you offered with, don't take me literally. I know, Joe, I, 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 I said that before words. you came, Z. I said oh, that okay. before you came. <laughs> Be because because th that might have be been implanted in my in my uh, in my little brain uh, and and it's only coming out now while while I'm researching Maimonides where where in the guide he 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 is begging he is begging the the the, the Jews of uh, that are enlightened and those that are on the way to enlightenment please don't forget this language even Torahic language is inadequate, but, but we have to use anthropomorphic language in order to maintain a non-anthropomorphic deity. <laughs> Paradox. Rabbi, there was a note in the chat. Can you give examples of anthropomorphic language in the, I guess, in the Torah? Vayichar af Hashem, and God got angry with the Jewish people. Ang angry? Really? You're kidding me. A cosmic, in ineffable God has 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 
has mood swings, <laughs> gets angry, gets pissed. Really, really. Is that really, really a God? Is that really a Jewish God? Really? Is that the God of the mystics? Is that the God of Keter? Is that, is that even possible to say in, 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 in uh, 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 Trevor, I, it, it, there, there, there is a Talmudic, there is a Talmudic expression. You, you know the word anthropomorphism is 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 uh, mentioned uh, in 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 the Talmud and in the Torah when the Talmud says. Uh, it's it's five five beautiful Hebrew words, so simple, so simple, that really encapsulates what I'm saying. When the Talmud says, you you you'll know it, you'll know it. I'll I'll even if you have a, a uh, even if you have a small uh, Hebrew vocabulary, you will you will get this. So, so memorize it. It's not hard. Dibra Torah, Dibra Torah. What does that mean? Daber Torah, Dibra Torah. The Torah spoke. Bilashon. Bilashon. In the language of B'nai Adam, of, of regular people. The, tar, the, the Talmud uh, sets, sets this uh, uh, fundamental concept down that that should really do away, that proves Maimonides's point, that does away with all, with all of our perplexities. How can the Torah speak about God of being angry? And for that matter of having compassion or having love, on one level or another, the transcendent God is 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 a uh, it, again does not have mood swings. Rabbi Akiva, do you want to take the? I Hebrew? want I want everyone to memorize that. Dibra Torah belashon b'nei Adam. The Torah speaks in the language of regular people depicts the highest Keter level of transcendent being in the language of people. And I think we have we have been immature about leaving it at that level. I do, I do not, I do not want to be treated like a baby. We have to graduate. We have to graduate from lashon from anthrop from from being being dragged into anthropomorphic metaphors, and we have to we have to release ourselves from that inadequate language, 
and come to a place of higher consciousness about God. Kim, go. Is anyone? So we have Shabri and then Rabbi Cantoresa. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Kim. After all, when you use the word infinite, can one in our language, my language, how can I describe infinite? You know, God is infinite. I can't say what that means. I mean, when I was thinking about once I said to you, God is love. What does that mean? It all is indescribable, actually. So maybe that's why silence is the best language. Uh, Shabri, you're you're right. You're right on. But 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 the. the that's what we we sort of concluded last week, but but there there is a problem with silence too. There's a problem. Right. So we we concluded last week that 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 and, and that's why Maimonides says you 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 cannot talk about God. You can only talk about God in in terms of ne negative. In terms or, of the negative, what what God isn't, or God, is, God isn't matter. God isn't human. Uh, so so that's what he said. But but there's there's a little problem with that because because uh, it, be, uh, the the human being on on the malchut level that that's what that's what dibra Torah belashon bnei adam means. That 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 the sages and even the Torah, and even the highest prophecy of Moses was compelled somehow to use language, because because if it uh, although silence is is the ultimate form of pra of praising uh, and and talking about God. Uh, it 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 wasn't it wasn't practical because <laughs> I can I cannot teach my my child <laughs> about God by being silent, <laughs> and I, I cannot that. teach the morals and and ethical instructions of what I of what of what I. Uh, perceive as God's will through silence. So, so yeah, theologically silence, yes. It, I, I would say, I would say, uh, Shabri, I would differentiate. On a private level, part of, part of my getting in touch with my God, I certainly would include silence uh, uh, in, in my, in my, in my uh, worship kind of techniques, I, I would use sil silent meditation uh, as a technique. But as as a as a teaching tool, <laughs> I, I think we need something. I, I think we need Debra Torah. I think we need words. Okay, I think we have Rabbi, and thank you. Well, um, could I add just one more little little add-on on this, please? Sure, a little add-on, sure. How about using a word that connotates God, like Adonai, instead of a mantra, let's say, because in Jewish you don't use a mantra. But what about Adonai? The, the essence of Adonai will bring you there. All right, uh, Shabri, first of all, we use mantras all the time. You, you, we use, what do you mean Judaism doesn't have mantras? What do you mean? We, we have mantras all the time. Every verse in the Torah is a mantra. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That is one of our most famous 
and more, most uh, powerful mantras. Shiviti, all every verse in the Psalms is a mantra. Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid. Uh, every every verse from 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 our scriptures is a mantra. Kadosh 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 Adonai Tzvaot Melochal Haaretz Kevodo is a mantra. We have mantras put on our doorposts called a mezuzah. That's a, that's a, a, the embodiment of a house mantra, a mantra for our house. <laughs> okay, little question, big answer. Rabbi Kansas, thanks for asking. Hi, Rabbi. <laughs> Hi, Risa. How are you? Okay, how are you? Um, you you kind of took the words out of my mouth. As a teacher, we definitely need, especially depending on the age that we teach, we need to, and this is where I get tongue-tied, I cannot say this word, anthropomorphic language, because I think that is the only, one of the few ways that children, especially, because everything is so abstract, yeah, um, yeah, and we uh, want yeah. to make it very concrete, therefore we need this kind of language, we need metaphors, we need comparisons, uh, we need this kind of language to help them understand and appreciate God at, at, on their level, and we're supposed to teach at a person's level. And there may be even some adults that need this kind of language. For, for them hey, to Risa, 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 maybe, <laughs> maybe some adults, we, for, for, for sure, even adults. But you, but you know, but you know what the problem is? We, what you're saying is applicable absolutely to children and absolutely to adolescents and adults. You know what the, pro you know what the problem is? That we, we, we I, I'm including myself, I'm including myself in this. We as teachers have forgotten that after grade five, there has to be a completely new Jewish educational program. And after that, that, that starts, that starts retranslating childish metaphors into more mature adult metaphors. We as teachers have forgotten that adults of 30 years, 40 years old, 65 year old are still walking around with the metaphors they learned Mm -hmm. when they were in grade five. We, we as teachers have, e either we as teachers, like, don't, don't, don't know it ourselves anymore and are still teaching the, <laughs> the old Lashon, the old language of childhood, Either the teachers don't, don't know the new language or they knew, know the new language and have not implemented this in day schools or in adult ed uh, 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 classes like this. That, that the, the, the teachers have not broken through. Uh, 
I, I see a generation that Mamish needs a deprogramming, <laughs> Mamish, a, a deprogramming of Torah language. I would institute this in every high school, in every Jewish high school, a deprogramming of what you learned for the last eight years. May I say something? Maybe not a deprogramming, sure. but with, but as as children mature, there's a way to gradually move into the 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 level that they should be in, and there is a way to do that. But that's another workshop for another time. Um, what else I wanted to add, please, if you don't mind, sure. is that the Book of Navi is full of emotions, uh, speaking about God's emotions. I mean, how oh. upset God is with our behaviors or how pleased now God is with our behaviors because the, 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 the Nevi'im are, are constantly warning us about how God is going to to punish or do this or that if we don't change our ways therefore we better change our ways it's kind of like a vicious cycle of emotions uh, absolutely uh, absolutely uh the the uh heschel heschel gets uh heschel gets his entire theory and 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 as i said before heschel heschel's uh, Heschel's theology is really uh, is really pe people don't uh, m make the association right away, but Heschel's theory of divine pathos is coming straight from from Hasid from Hasidism and from the 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 core of Jewish mysticism, and Heschel's whole idea of of recognizing and acknowledging the ineffable God whilst at the same time, the ineffable God, but also the, the God of divine pathos. Heschel says, the God of divine pathos, it comes from the prophets where they talk, they talk about about God being abandoned by the Jewish people, God feeling sorry for the Jewish people, God feeling angry with the Jewish people, the, the Jewish people in a love relationship, like a husband and a wife uh, with, with God, and right? So all, all of this pathos, all of this uh, uh, emotion going on through the visions and through the deep da bearing, through the words and language of prophetic enlightenment. So you are correct. Uh, the the Nevi the 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 prophets are are replete with the an anthropomorphic God. Uh, uh, just feeling everything. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Akiva. The last question we have for this round will be Sandra Fruedman. Please hold all other questions to our next break. You're all going to think I'm I'm backward or dumb. I never had any uh, Jewish upbringing, but when my kids had to go to um, Hebrew school, uh, the rabbi they went to did not give any classes, and he was just uh, an old-fashioned rabbi. But we finally got a progressive rabbi and he started teaching us classes. And when I found out that most rabbis don't believe that everything that happened in the Bible was Emmas, I was thunderstruck. I just believed, I just thought that's the way it is. When he said that they couldn't find any, um, any uh, thing about the, the Exodus, no clues, anything. I'm thinking to myself, how can this be? How can they not believe that it happened? 
But then, of course, I got educated about the metaphors and the similes and the, that's all, that's me. Sandy, uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to let you off the hook just with simply that. You you are you are saying so uh, 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 along the way you have come across uh, teachers and uh, and or rabbis that have that have supported this idea of metaphor? Yes, yes. The, uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, that's... The first few rabbis that we had, they never gave any classes. So I had no idea what they believed. And then came along this young rabbi who was a fabulous teacher and he just shocked me. And then came Rabbi Akiva. Does it? Yeah, I, I have to comment on that, Sandy. Uh, because, because, because Pesach is coming up. <laughs> I have to comment on that because Pesach is coming up. You know, a, a few years ago, there was a, a rabbi in Los Angeles. Th this is more than a few years ago. It's around 15, 15 years ago. And his sermon on Pesach uh, that year, and, and it, it, made re re it reverberated throughout the Jewish world. He started off by saying that the exodus from Egypt and the slavery of the Hebrews uh, 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 2,756 years ago uh, never, ha never occurred, never happened. That's how he started his sermon. How could a rabbi say that? Blah, 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 blah. Friends, th think about that for a moment. What, what he was basically saying is that this, the, the, the exodus from Egypt and the Torah's narrative of the, of the slavery in Egypt and the exodus from Egypt historically was not a reality. It never occurred historically. But, but, he said, it doesn't matter. Because what really matters is the lesson learned from the, the myth this myth, so it never happened. So I hate, to, I hate to, to burst your balloon. It never happened, but he nevertheless said, but there is, it doesn't make Pesach irrelevant. It doesn't make Pesach, it, it doesn't make the lesson of freedom and slavery and opp uh, oppressing a people or not oppressing a people, it doesn't make that the moral or ethical lessons of that uh, irrelevant. Jews across North America could not handle that. They could not handle, they, they could not handle the story of Pesach merely as a myth, from which a great lesson is extracted, a lesson that we, that we ought to be applying to today's world, they couldn't handle it. No, the Pesach story 
had to be, it's not myth, it's true. And because, and because it's true, its relevance is more relevant. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about, about at your Seder table, demystifying de the story of, of the Hebrew slaves coming to, to spiritual and, and physical freedom? Uh, how, how do you feel about telling the story, the Haggadah of Pesach at your Pesach table to your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren and saying before, before the Seder, by the way, guys, this is all not true. I am telling you, I am telling you a myth. I am telling you a story that we commemorate and that we have commemorated for 3000 years, uh, every Jewish, nearly every Jewish family have used this myth as an example. This myth is no, no different than the story I told you last night about Cinderella. and her evil sisters and her, her ultimate victory in getting slipped on the shoe. It's no different than that, but, but, but there's a more, I want, I want to teach you the moral. How, how, how would you feel about that? Who are you asking? I'm asking, uh, let's say I'm asking Kim. <laughs> let's say I'm asking Kim and Bruce. And Michael. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, so but before you answer, I I am what I am merely trying to differentiate here is when we view Torah, when Maimonides, we have to go through a, a, an extremely fine, a, a refined mindset of when we are talking about the Exodus, how, how, how should I be viewing it as a, Maimonides insists that the exodus from Egypt is not one of those anthropomorphisms, is not a metaphor. Thou shalt not murder should be taken literally. The exodus from Egypt is a, a historical fact. And you know what he says? Believe it or not, I might be blowing you off your chairs, so put your seat belts on and hold on. <laughs> he says the exodus is should, should, is not in the category of metaphor or anthropomorphism. But you know what is? The Akedah. <laughs> the Akedah, Maimonides says, was, was a narrative in the Torah of an Abrahamic dream. Jacob's, the narrative of Jacob's ladder. No, no I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Jacob's ladder too. Of Jacob's ladder and Jacob's uh, a re wrestling match 
with, with the Sar shall Asa, with the angel of Asa, with the Sar shall Asa, when he go, when he, when he gets out of Bethel uh, with a limp, he says, is, 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 is a Jacob dream. It never really happened. It's a, it's a form of, uh, of prophecy, of imagination that we have to extract lessons from. So, so the question is, what, what is historical? What is metaphor in the Torah? You know, that's on us to investigate. We have to create our own starting points. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, so uh, all I'm saying, it, 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 it requires uh, uh, a, a, a preliminary and, and maybe even elementary uh, uh, graduating from kindergarten Judaism uh, into what, what the commentaries say. And, and you would be surprised what the commentaries say about what, what is anthropomorphic, what is metaphor, is the whole Torah one big myth? No. Is it all existentially, uh, uh, historically true? No. Go learn and find out. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> you gave me time to think of three different answers. Um, I think that we have par days as a tool and a mechanism to learn the Peshat. What does it actually say? And then maybe investigate the historical truth. What is it hinting towards? What can we learn from it? If you go right to Sod, there's nothing for those ideas to stand on. Beautiful. There's no foundation. Be beautifully said. Beautifully said. So, so Pardes, Pshat, Remez, Drush, different ways that, that even uh, in Talmudic times was recognized. How do I view this? Is it only Pshat? Is it uh, Drush? Is it... Is it allegory is it uh, metaphor uh, that then seek out so so uh, that, that's a beautiful response that 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 everything in the Torah actually requires four levels of investigation and that's why Maimonides says don't take the Torah only literally there's more than pshat. Use your imagination. The Torah can exist simultaneously on five different levels. I remember that the very, very first thing that you taught in the Hallandale Jewish Center 25 years ago was pardes. You said we couldn't even begin the first class of the Institute without understanding Pashat, Remez, Drash, and Sod. Um, and, 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 I, look, and, and look where we are. <laughs> right 20, back at Pashat, Remez, Sod. 23 years later, focusing on, don't you realize there is a multiplicity of levels that we that we operate on, and that all of those levels uh, should be understood to capture the beauty uh, of what the what the Torah is trying desperately to convey to us. Okay. So, um, do you want? Do you still do you want Michael? Yeah, please, you? please, please. Okay, so Michael, your hand is up. You can un unmute and then we'll go to Bruce and then we'll see how much time we have. Okay, good morning. Uh, just uh, this is going to be quick, I think. Uh, first, as far as um, Passover and the Exodus, I mean, it's something that I know is true because I saw the movie and that did it for me. Um, okay, that joke didn't go over very well. Anyway, to me, the heart of the matter 
And, and I asked the question last week, a uh, couple of weeks ago, um, the, the belief is, is, is I, in your question, what, what I got from it was that if I believe something, does that create a different response in my life to how I'm going to act based on whether it's a belief or a myth? And, and I guess, you know, Passover being one of the, you know, the, the major holidays, you know, certainly my entire life would be celebrated as compared to the Greek myths, which I've read about or studied a little bit, which seemed kind of fuzzy. You know, they were just stories. But Passover was, was, was real. It was something that, that happened. Um, but it's a, a belief doesn't mean that if I believe something that it's true. So um, the, the response to Maimonides' um, descriptions of, of the, of the um, imminence and the transcendence, the, the reaction that for me that I've kind of evolved into as whether it's a belief or whether it's true or not is questionable. As you just said, you've been studying and talking about this for 23 years and, and longer. But the, the, the compassion and love and, and caring and, and, and um, relationships with other people is the bottom line, whether it's a belief. So the question is, if you believe it, does it make it easier to do the right thing? I think that's the, the essence of the question that um, probably yes, but it doesn't necessarily need to have the belief in order to be able to do the right thing, but although it probably does make it easier. So I think that's my answer to your question from before. I, I, thank you, Mike. I, 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 I most definitely, I most definitely uh, agree that there, <clears throat> that if we if we are being asked to <clears throat> conceptualize, some, someone said, I think it, I think it was Rabbi R Risa. That that's that said that that mentioned something that like hit me that that if we are asked a, a, as Jews only to think abstractly, I mean, uh, on one level or another, Maimonides is, is so, is so abstract, you know, he, he is asking, he is asking us to, to, to think abstractly. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that. Th there is something that differentiates between abstract thinking and and experiential evidence and then being being asked to extract messages from it there is something different than saying you know there's a country in this world think abstractly that america never had never had a racial never had racial problems the civil rights uh uh, uh the slave the slavery in america really i'm a, i'm a, i'm a slavery denier i deny that for 200 years, uh, America was steeped in inhumane racial ra 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 racism. I refuse to believe that. But abstractly, I, I am. I today, I'm. I'm not. I'm not a racist. I believe in freedom for whites and blacks uh, on an equal level, but I do deny that anything ever historically occurred in America. That wouldn't do, would it? That 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 would. 
there, there I, I I believe in the equ equality of all human beings. But I deny that six million Jews were exterminated in World War II. There is something about a truth about believing in, in an abstract lesson and a historical truth that occurred from which the, uh, a, a moral lesson is coming from the, the, there and and that is that that is the draw towards anthropomorphism okay uh, if if something if something is real on the malchut level on the malchut level if something is real mike um, I, I'm addressing like your con. If something is true on a malchut level, not only on a mythological abstract level, if something's true on a malchut level, the truth extracted from that is tends in our minds to be truer. <laughs> With six minutes, do you want to, shall we move, Bruce, do you have something that you want to add to his original question? I have a whole other class to add. <laughs> so, but okay. I, uh, the, ne right. next class is going to, next class is going to be the, the famous uh, Maimonidean uh, parable about the king's court. Oh, that's talking a good about one. Met talking about metaphors, talking about like uh, Maimonides uh, warning us about metaphors and uses the ultimate metaphor, the, the ultimate Maimonidean metaphor, uh, <laughs> which should you will carry with you for the rest of your lives. Uh, once we go through it, and uh, and that next week, that is is as much as we are uh, trying, you know, to be enlightened and smart and gain knowledge. Uh, the the next half of next week's class is going to be about the role the very important role of doubt and perplexity and, and the importance of maintaining doubt in, in our own enlightenment. Without, without doubt, there is no such thing as enlightenment. They, they go hand in hand. Uh, Kim, and on that note, <laughs> I don't know if there's any. I, 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 I don't know if we were going to follow up with I, I, I need more questions. I, I, I sort of feel. No, you that, only have three minutes. You only have but three I minutes. But I sort of feel the more. Uh, the, the the more we are discussing, I'm not getting I'm not getting enough uh, back. You know, uh, you 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 ought Bruce, to be are you having going to unmute to to speak to 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 respond. And Marilyn Schwartz, I'm we're taking people back. who are speaking for the first time. Okay, I'm holding back because I'm very simple. To me, the metaphor is very real, and it's with me constantly. It's in my kitchen. Uh, it's what I'm sitting with people. I have to say, I hear the news uh, about parents bribing someone to get their children into a certain college. To me, that's Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So I am totally using the uh, Torah as a metaphor in every day of my life. 
I don't have to right. say it, I think. It, and uh, I appreciate what you're saying. It makes my life very real and meaningful. Great, great. Thank you, Marilyn. I, I really thank you for that. Okay. We have Bruce unmuted with his hand up. Okay, Rabbi, I'd like to make a commitment to you to write an essay on my response to your question and the circumstances you laid out uh, during this uh, class. And um, I'm going to spend uh, a certain amount of time writing it and, 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 and getting pleasure, not only from your class, I would say, um, but, but from the continuation in the writing and thinking and exploring of the ideas that you put forth. Thank you. God bless you. Thank, thank Bruce. Bruce, in response to that, I, I would, you, you, you'll certainly, certainly forward that essay to me as yes. that, that we, we, uh, we can share share uh, in this in yeah this, i know in someone in mossad who, who who can can can, can, <laughs> can carry it to you and deliver no i'm kidding but uh, we'll get it to you okay um donna is the only one who ha who has her hand up that hasn't spoken so that will be the last question anyone else we welcome to to send Rabbi Akiva a text message, okay? Because it's 129B, to your point, Ms. Donna. Um, I wanted to make, I think, two comments. One, I agree that something that actually happens has more meaning uh, than something that is used as a metaphor. However, with that said, mm -hmm. if the metaphor and the traditions that go around, let's say Passover, and it's not real, but a metaphor, um, has been carried on generation after generation after generation for the purpose of understanding what one should and shouldn't do to substantiate what was written in the Torah. I think that ultimately it would probably have the same effect. It's just that coming in, with the thought that it is something that <laughs> actually happened, um, we generationally, that's how we grew up, that's, that would have a much more meaningful message to us than if it were a metaphor handed down from generation to generation. But eventually, I think it would pretty much balance out. Um, and I, I, I wanted to also comment about uh, prayer, silence, and language. Um, I was once, I once read that revelation cannot be expressed in language, that a revelation is something that is intimate between you and, and the creator. And it's hard to find words for that. It, it's, it's an experience. Um, and I mm -hmm. also agree with you that language is, is also needed in order to teach, but the the relationship aspect of one to God um, is more in here and in the heart than in the mouth. And please feel free to comment on either any or none. And I love you with words. Hmm. Donna, your, your, your words were profound. It, if, if, you know, part, part of the Jewish sensibility is if we, if we were lone islands J just me me myself me myself and, and and you god right you you would you would be uh, a thousand percent correct
the Jewish, the, the, the question is, how, how are we able to convey private, intimate enlightenment, revelations, conclusions of our lives? How are we able to convey that? It, it cannot be conveyed through silence. So how, how am I able to convey revelation, re, re, historic, cosmic, and personal revelation to the people that I love the most? Let's say that's your children, or, or if not children, then it's our, our closest people. I, I have to be able to, I have to be able to relay somehow my, the deepest sense, the deepest enlightenment that, that I have accumulated in my life experience to somebody else whom I love. That is one of the definitions of love. I want to become intimate with you, and I want to share my secrets with you. Another word for secrets are is revelations. How do I do that? It's not through silence. It is. It has to be through through words somehow. And it, has to be, and it has to be done through the proper words. So if I was if I was all alone by myself, myself, me, myself, and and my God, then silence, silent meditation. Uh, I I don't I don't have I don't have to. Uh, I, I, I don't have to use words. Uh, I use memory, I use thought, I use pure, pure meditator. Uh, but if I, if I want to communicate, if I want to transmit any semblance of that enlightenment to another, I, I, I automatically have to start using words. We're not saying anything different. I'm agreeing in order to teach, you have to use words, but in order to have a revelation, in order to have that communication with, with source, it's done in, in dot, it's done in silence. It's combining the mind with the heart in order to receive that information. And then it's up to us to be able to try to translate the experience or the information that we I, 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 I agree totally. So I, I, I was talking, I, I was referring to the transferring. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that, that is in the transferring, we, we, have, we, we have the challenge in, right. in, the, in the revelation maybe, Maybe that that comes uh, easier in in the transferring. I, I think we have a tra we have a trans. You know, I I think people. I, I think we we all have a a, a a challenge. We we all have an unbelievable an unbelievable capacity of of overt love. Uh, that lies within. I think humanity's problem is is we 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 have a tremendous deficiency in transferring and transmitting love. So Donna, on your point, I can have I can have all the love in the world. If I have a huge deficiency in transmitting my love, I'm, I'm really screwed. 
Be, uh, if 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 we have if we have a lot of love, and we have great deficiency in transmitting that love to to other, th then then I, I'm in prison in my own love because I, I have challenges in in sharing it. So so I'm I'm pretty well screwed. <laughs> I am going to invite us all to share in your love second night of Passover at 530 in America. It will not be a formal Seder, but you will be offering teachings on freedom and the music of Passover to inspire. So I encourage everyone to register. Um, there is a fee for that because there is. Um, but it's discounted to half of what it would be if you were not already a class pass holder. Um, Rabbi Jeff is this Thursday with the third lecture on Haggadah. And I already have like two aha moments that are, you know, are warranted at my Seder table. So I just really encourage us.